Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive. Quite frankly, I get most of my news from you. Joan Esposito. Y'all ready for this? On WCPT 820. Hi, thanks for joining me this Thursday, October 3rd. Want to remind you of our uh, new schedule where Monday through Thursday, we spend the first hour talking about things that interest us, things that are going on that we want to talk about, political things, or you know what, maybe just interesting things like the fact that um, Melania, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I heard that little sop to Melania at at the top of the hour, oh, you know, she thinks a woman should have autonomy. Well, isn't that just really weird considering the fact that her husband is adamantly opposed to that? Uh, but the real thing that I wanted to share about Melania is that come to light, you know, she's got this new book out aptly titled Melania. And uh, CNN reached out to her about doing an interview about the book. And uh, her publishers sent back a contract saying, sure, we'll do an interview, but you're going to pay us $250,000. And oh, by the way, um, you're going to sign all these non-disclosure agreements so that, you know, you can't talk about this deal. And CNN was like, are you kidding me? A, we don't pay for interviews and B to a quarter of a million dollars so that she can have our audience to promote her book and we're going to sign a non-disclosure agreement? No, no, a thousand times no. And wouldn't you know that somehow word about this got out and uh, then, of course, Melania's people were, oh, no, I'm so- Gosh, gosh, I'm sorry you got all those documents that mention you by name and spell out this deal. It was a mistake. We never meant to send that to you. It was it was a mistake. It was not. No, no, it's not what it looks like. Uh, you know, I'm you know, the, I think the printer just somehow generated these documents and forwarded them to you. I don't know how it happened. And yeah, you know, it, it does seem a little suspicious that the uh, person who was negotiating for this interview is, you know, mentioned by name in this document. Plus, there is a line where this person was asked to sign uh, in agreement to all these conditions and this payment. But it was just we don't really even know where this document came from. We're very puzzled by it, but we're. We're 100% sure it was just a mistake and we had nothing to do with it. $250,000 for Melania to sit down and talk. Do you think it's going to be, do you think she'll be best? Will she be best? Unbelievable. And now it's all like, oh, we never did that. There have been times when organizations um, would cut deals in return for some kind of exclusivity. But, you know, honey, paying for an interview? Um, Not if you're a news organization. Not if you're a news organization. That is, um, that's a breach of ethics. You know, it was always for years... The, you know, there was the big rivalry between Good Morning America and the Today Show. <clears throat> and the Today Show people used to get a little bit ticked off because they felt that they were... Today Show is part of the news division at NBC. Good Morning America was part of the entertainment arm of ABC. So because the Today Show was part of the news department, they were expected to abide by journalistic ethics. Like, you know, we don't pay for interviews. We don't make promises to get interviews. And um, there was always um, some resentment because sometimes Good Morning America would land interviews. And it was obviously because they had made people promises. But ethically, they excused it because they said, we're entertainment. 
Good morning, America. We're in the entertainment division. That We're not a journalistic organization. We don't have to abide by journalistic ethics. See how that game is played? Um, but bottom line, uh, CNN has declined to pay Melania Trump a quarter of a million dollars to sit down with them and promote her damn book. <sighs> you know, she may not be a Trump by birth, but she clearly has the grifter spirit. She clearly fits in with the um, grifter family. Grifters in chief. Okay. Um, as I said a long time ago, before I completely derailed myself... We are, Monday through Thursday, we spend the first hour of every show taking your calls to talk about the news of the day. 773-763-9278. 773-763-9278. You can call me on that line. You can text me on that line. I see we've already gotten some texts. Yes, Raina, I agree. Uh, Melania makes my skin crawl as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, let's go to the phone lines. Our good friend Jim from Chicago is standing by. Hi, Jim. How are you today? <laughs> Hi, John. I, you know, I hesitate to call, but Jack Smith unfurled that uh, indictment against Trump. Now, this mm-hmm. this is dynamite. This would have sunk any politician anywhere in any century on this earth. <sighs> when, believe this or not, he's sitting there three hours watching the uh, the uh, riot. And they said, they're going to hang uh, Mike Pence. He goes, his perfect word, so what? Yeah. <laughs> so what he said. Yeah. You know, I mean, M- M- Mr. Mr. President, see- Ms. Mike Pence has been moved to a secure location um, where we're going to try to keep him away from the rioters. So what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, think of that. If, if you picked up a history book and read that about it, some politician, you wouldn't believe that they'd still be running for mm-hmm. office. And there was another one, along with his, uh, his wife, her estranged wife, she was paid a $237 check she was handed to come to one of his uh, rallies. And nobody knows the author of the check. Nobody will own up to being the author of the check. Uh, when I mean, when, when you say his wife, you mean Melania? Who, who's Melania. Wife are you talking about? Yeah, M- 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 Melania, yeah. Trump's wife, was bribed $237,000 to come to one of his rallies. Because I imagine the Republican Party, you know, their family matters, family party. They want him to be with his wife. She's estranged, apparently. But somebody paid her $237,000. To uh, to show up, and nobody well, you wants know what, to. Jim, uh, nobody that wants... doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Uh, a the, <laughs> no, uh, the Republicans would want her there, and that they'd pay her to get her there because you know, on the uh, Trump airplane, he has been accompanied a lot by Laura Loomer. Laura Loomer, I guess her name right. is, and she's um, really really radical. She makes Trump almost look middle of the road. And I and, you know, I think that people are starting in in his campaign, people are starting to worry that she looks like uh, Melania's replacement while Melania is sitting home with the kid. And um, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if they wanted her there and that in that, you know, she said, yeah, you want me there? You want me there? Write me a check. I, you know, yeah, it's no, a no. very it's transactional it's, it's, crowd. It's, 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 and this young woman fed him the story about feeding cats and dogs. She fed him that story. And he's so stupid that he bought it hook, line, and sinker. But you know what kills me, Joan? I heard, I don't know how this happens, but she has a million and two hundred thousand followers. Now, who in God's name would get up in the morning and say, oh, I think I'll follow this nut? Yeah. I, I don't get that. I don't get that, Joan. I, I'll never get that. I can't. You know, if I had one follower, it'd be one too many for me. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Joan, you take care. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the call. Always a, always a fun time talking with you. Yeah, um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, what, what Jim was making reference to. Jack Smith, In this is in the Washington, D.C. prosecution against Trump for his role in the January 6th insurrection. Judge Chuckton is the one overseeing this. Um, Jack Smith, of course, had to redo 
his paperwork once the Supreme Court, once John Roberts apparently got everybody together and said, oh, we got to give Trump some protection here. we got to give him some cover. And they created this partial limited immunity for acts when you're like, you know, in office. So Jack Smith had to redo his um, charges against Trump and make them fit the new model. So what he did apparently was if um, he made sure that everything in the indictment was related to Trump on a personal basis, like Trump's interaction with Rudy Giuliani, his personal lawyer, um, Trump's interaction with uh, with people who were not high ranking government officials. And um, Trump, when that was filed, Trump's lawyers were like, oh, this should be sealed. This is, you know, we, we got to keep this under wraps. And Judge Chuckton said, you know what? I don't think so. That's not that's not how these trials work. So she released a, a Jack Smith's filing was either 155 or 165 pages. There were some redactions, but the bulk of it was released to the public. And um, we got to see this real specifics about specific conversations that took place in the White House. Specific conversations while the riot- rioting was going on. And, um, you know, you already knew who he was. So that's, it's not like I think you're going to read this document and be completely shocked. But it is a reminder of just how callous. This is a man who cares for nobody but himself. And even if, J.D. Vance, I hope you're listening to this, even if you're one of his top lieutenants, there is loyalty is a one-way street with Donald Trump, an absolute one-way street. And when people are no longer useful, they are discarded. One thing the indictment does show, though, we knew that Donald Trump was putting a lot of pressure on Mike Pence to do something that Mike Pence had neither the power nor the inclination to do and not certify the election. Uh, the pressure and the conversations were even worse than we thought. You know, he's telling Pence how if he doesn't do this, everybody's going to hate him and he's going to be ruined and it's going to be over. And even Tim Walls said, you know, I've never, I never agreed uh, on policy with Mike Pence. But I always felt that he cared about country. And um, now we have the conversations that took place that day that let us know just how awful Donald Trump was, how close it came. And for, you know, Don, um, Mike Pence, most of us just viewed him as an absolutely powerless lapdog. But when it counted, he took a stand. And he is still to this day paying the price for that. Let's go back to the phone lines. Myrna is on the line from Chicago. Hi, Myrna. Thanks for calling today. Hi, Joan. Two things. I sent you a text earlier with images of uh, one of Trump's former um, assistants on his on his staff uh, admitted to Trump not wanting to release emergency funds uh-huh. to victims of the wildfires in California. Yes, I hope that he, was I hope uh, that was reported in these documents. When remember when there were bad fires, there was bad, uh, horrible weather wreaking havoc, and one of the places yeah. where there was a lot of damage was Orange County, California. And Trump originally told his people that he did not want any federal emergency funds to go to Orange County, California, because he felt, you know, California, they're just a bunch of Democrats. And one Mm -hmm. of the people on staff had to compile data showing that there were actually more registered Republicans in Orange County than there were Democrats. And then Trump said, Okay, well, then they can have disaster funds. Let's go ahead and do it. He 
did what he, what he is trying to sometimes accuse the Democrats of doing. Oh, well, you know, they're not going to they're not going to take care of you if you live in a Republican area. They're not going to you know there aren't going to be any programs that come your way. There's not going to be any money that comes your way because they're Democrats mm-hmm. and you're a Republican. And Joe Biden has never behaved that way. He has poured so much money into Republican areas that, as you know, Myrna, some of the Republican Mm -hmm. Congress people have tried to take credit for some of the projects. Oh, look, we have a new bridge. Uh, Let's do a ribbon cutting. But wait a minute, Congressman, you voted against uh, the program that gave us the money to build the new bridge. Oh, well, that's just details. That's just details. But Trump actually Uh did it. He was going to deny federal support to Orange County, California, because he thought they were a bunch of Democrats. And why should why should he help them? Why should he help them until an aide showed him the voter registration? You know, there's really more Republicans in Orange County than there are Democrats. These are your people. Oh, oh, well, in that case. okay, Yeah. okay. Let's sign those funds off. Let's get those funds out. Yep. 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 Yeah. I hope all of his supporters in Orange County are reading that and letting it sink in as to yeah. what he really is yeah. and what he thinks of them. Uh, second thing, Melania, she's not quite as dumb as we think she is, or she's got someone behind her who's making smart decisions. The, the request for payment for interviews, think about it, Joan. He's getting sued everywhere. He's going to lose all of his money. So their premarital uh, agreement, she's not going to get anything when she divorces him. So she's basically setting herself up with a nice little trust fund, or hoping to, <laughs> by charging for interviews. So she, like I said, she's not quite as dumb as we think she is. She, <laughs> she's setting herself up because she knows yeah. where he's going. She's not getting anything out of him when, the, when she divorces. Well. So, it's my, it, my um, two cents for today. Yeah, well, you know, um, there have been rumors that even when he was president, that if he wanted something for her, remember when he was first uh, started his term as president, she was still in New York, and the argument was, well, Barron's in school in New York, and they don't want to mm-hmm. take him out of school. And mm-hmm. he was so erratic that the Republicans really, really wanted her there. They felt she was a stabilizing force. And there are rumors, mm-hmm. and I cannot substantiate this, so take it with a grain of salt, that every time either Republicans or Donald Trump wanted something from her, they had to rewrite her uh, settlement, her post-marriage settlement. That every time wow. they wanted something from her... She turned in that into um, a benefit for her down the road. And but I agree with you for a guy who has so many court cases and so many lawyers bills. And think about it, Myrna, unless Mm -hmm. he wins the presidency, I mean, people aren't going to continue to send him donations. He's got Mm -hmm. the biggest grift of all right now. I'm running for president. I need your money. And then he can, he's got these packs set up so that he can do pretty much anything he wants with the money. So he's paying mm-hmm. his lawyers. And yeah, if I were her, I would be very worried about this gravy train coming to an end. Oh, yeah, big time. So like yeah. I, said, I, hope, I, hope no, I hope no one is dumb enough to actually pay her anything for her interviews. Just to teach her a lesson, too. Because remember when she wore that coat that said, I don't care? Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, and it's that is, I don't understand. I don't understand her. I do, I do know. I, I never knew, um, Ivana, mm-hmm. but I have a friend who was good friends with Ivana Trump. And let's just say Ivana Trump did not think that, um, Melania was an intellectual. Let's just put it that way. Let's just put it that way. Well, you know, a claim that she speaks, I think, five or seven foreign languages has never actually been proven. No, and Donald Trump's the only one who says that. Yeah, and and anytime she's been in public and someone speaks to her in a foreign language, she does the basic hello or thank you. And that's Mm -hmm. as far as conversation goes. And then somebody cuts in to, to stop that conversation. Yeah. So basically, it seems like they're just saying she's a liar. She doesn't speak that many languages at all. 
She well, she certainly English. hasn't shown any. <laughs> she certainly <laughs> hasn't shown that publicly. You'd think she'd be proud yeah. of that. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you go, Joan. I appreciate you taking my call. Have a great oh, one. Thanks, Myrna. Always a, always a pleasure. Um, we were talking about the fact that uh, Melania went to CNN when they inquired about interviewing her because of her new memoir, and uh, her publisher sent off a letter saying, sure, we'd love to do an interview. It'll cost you $250,000, and you have to sign this non-disclosure agreement, et cetera, and so forth. And when CNN said no thank you and then made it all public, uh, the publisher claimed, oh, oh I, where did that letter come from? It didn't come from us. Well, okay, maybe it came from us, but we didn't mean it. I mean, it was a, it was an accidental letter we didn't mean to write and we didn't mean to send. So, um, one of you smart aleck texters texted in, so is it safe to assume you will not pay to interview me? Darn it. Yes, it is safe to assume that I will not pay to interview you. Now, if you want to pay to interview me, well, you know, I think then we should sit down and talk, right? I mean, I'm not saying I'd agree to it, but let's just, I I think I should be open to your arguments of why you should pay me to sit down and talk. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Kristen in Minnesota texted in, I think I figured out what happened at the VP debate. In previous elections, when Tim Walls ran for Congress or for governor, he was running for himself. But this is the first time he's running in support of someone else. He has said that his biggest fear is letting Kamala Harris down. I think Walls would not, was not himself in the debate because of worrying that he might ruin things for Harris. And if that's the case, that shows he cares more about others than himself, which is good. I um, also saw a post one of the political pundits was posting about the vice presidential debate. And I couldn't find, you know, the explanation for this. But they posted that, you know, when people first said to me that... um, Tim Walls had a was had a bunch of anxiety about the debate, was very nervous about the debate. You know, I thought it was just spin. But after talking to people, I'm beginning to think that his anxiety was much worse than I first thought. And I couldn't find anything more. Who the person had talked to, what people had said, who gave that initial appraisal that he was basically just anxious as all heck in that format. So, you know, but I thought that was that was um, something worse, worth pursuing. Tim Walls was clearly very nervous at the beginning of the vice presidential debate, but I thought that's just because, um, I don't know if he won the coin toss or lost the coin toss, but he had to start. And uh, he seemed a little wobbly at first, but in a big national debate like that, being a little wobbly at the beginning, is not out of the ordinary. As a matter of fact, it's far more common than somebody hitting the ground running. But um, maybe there was more to that than uh, we were led to believe. Uh, We are going to take a break. 773-763-9278. We are going to take your calls. We are going to talk about the news of the day and the news of the week. And uh, all that when we come right back after this. There's no excuse to miss Joan Esposito. It's number one on my stereo. Live, local, and progressive. You can listen to her daily at WCPT820.com on your computer or phone. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT Willow Springs, is powered by ComEd. Visit ComEd.com slash clean. Now back to Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. Uh, I have a text that came in that I want to I want to talk about because if I gave this impression, then I gave a uh, an incorrect impression. So um, 
Uh, somebody who said uh, that they are a truck driver, they're out and about right now, uh, said that on my show yesterday, I started by voicing my concern about the vice presidential debate um, and that I had multiple concerns about the Democratic candidate. Um, and it says, of course, you don't talk about any policies by the Democratic Party. You can only speak negative of your next president and vice president. Uh, Donald Trump and Mr. Vance, by voicing all of your concerns and being nervous about the way the Democratic rep represented himself. Um, here's what I said about the vice presidential debate. If you just judged it on demeanor, uh, J.D. Vance, uh, you know, I don't know if he was uh, taking beta blockers to calm down, but J.D. Vance did not get rattled. He was cool. He was calm. He had this, what some people are describing as a little Mona Lisa smile on his face. He appeared um, very relaxed. Now, he also struck me as a little bit oily, like a, like a snake oil salesman. Because even though he was calm, cool, and collected... Almost everything out of his mouth was a lie, like when he looked at the camera and said, absolutely, apparently, genuinely, well, there was a peaceful transfer of power with the last election, so I really don't know what Democrats are so excited about. Com like, completely gaslighting us that January 6th either didn't happen or... Um, you know, since January 6th didn't result in a coup, I guess we should ignore it. So he was calm, cool, and collected, and lied like a rug. Tim Walls didn't seem so calm, cool, and collected. You know, I mean, we're used to this guy being relaxed and smiling, and, you know, we joke about how he brings the joy. And he seemed to be very serious and a little bit nervous. But what he said, everything he said, was actually the truth. So, if you listened to what they were saying, you would say Tim Walls was the winner. If you just looked at how their demeanor was, um, J.D. Vance was a cooler customer than Tim Walls. What is interesting... And I know I always tell you not to pay attention to the polls, et cetera, and so forth. But um, a group of, a rep, supposedly a group of representative voters was questioned after the vice presidential debate about uh, how they found the candidates' likability. Tim Walls still outscores J.D. Vance um, by double digits in like likability, but, but. After the vice presidential debate, both of their likability numbers went up. So people liked what they saw. If you liked Walls and you were listening to him, you liked him even better. Um, if you were inclined to like J.D. Vance, you liked him a little better. But um, I'm not, you know, Mr. Truck Driver... I don't know if you're a union truck driver or not, but if you belong to the Teamsters, you better be careful what you wish for. Why do you think Donald Trump is going to support you and your job? Donald Trump has said he is going to give tax cuts, more tax cuts to billionaires. Who do you think is going to pay for that, Mr. Truck Driver? Who do you think is going to pay for that? It's going to be you and me who pay for it. Donald Trump sat down with Elon Musk and was laughing about how, man, if Elon Musk's workers giving any, give him any trouble, he just fires them. And isn't that great? It's just so great that you do that. You know, maybe there's other things about Trump. Maybe you like the fact that he wants to get rid of all the black and brown people. I don't know. I don't know what it is that draws you to Donald Trump. But don't think he's going to be good for your wages, for your job. Because, honey, look at, 
You don't have to take my word for it. Look at how he's behaved in the past. When he was a developer in New York City, he was famous for screwing over the workers that built his properties. He was famous for it in New York. But you know what? Yeah. You do you. And thanks for um thanks for the thanks for the text and thanks for listening. Let's go back to the phone lines. Robert's on the line from Chicago. Hey Robert, how are you? Hi. I was just talking to the lady. Lady uh, B. And I was telling her Oh, that was you? No, that was Lady B. Now you're talking to me. Oh, did you hear everything we said? No, I didn't. Tell me about it. I was telling her what people don't realize that Donald Trump said when he said, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and never lose a vote. What he doesn't realize is because he don't care about nobody is whoever he shoots has a mother, a father, a sister, a daughter, a son. So he says, if I shoot you, I can shoot somebody. I shoot your father, you will still vote for me. If I yeah. shoot your mother, you will still vote for me. And nobody seems to understand that. What he just yeah. told them was, I can shoot your mom, your daddy, your son, your sister, your father, your pregnant wife, and you will still vote for me. And the people cheer them and say, wait, we love you, Donald. Listen to this. Little girl comes home with her grandma from school and says, Mama, Mama, if Donald Trump shoots me, will you still vote for him? She said, Donald Trump don't shoot good little girl. She said, he don't know me. He don't know if I'm a good little girl. If he shoots me, will you still vote for him? She said, you don't have to worry about Donald Trump shooting me. She said, little girl, realize she's not going to ask the question. She said, Mama, if Donald Trump shoots me, will you still vote for him? Her mother says, where are you getting this from? Who you been talking to? Little girl turns and walks towards the door where her grandmama's waiting. She said, come back here. Where are you going? She said, I'm going to grandmama's house. She said she don't care who it is shooting me, Donald Trump or somebody else. She's not going to vote for him. She turns and takes a few steps to the door. She turns back around with tears running out of her eyes and says, Grandmama says she ain't that stupid. You know, oh. are the Republicans that stupid? You know, turn your turn that to, to ask the Republicans, are you that stupid, especially the ones sitting on the fence? Are you that stupid to let Donald Trump tell you and the whole world? That you're so stupid, I can shoot your mama and you still vote for me. I can shoot your yep. pregnant wife and you still vote for me. And nobody seems to say anything about that. And this is not what somebody said he said, somebody thinks he said. Donald Trump said this on national TV to the whole world. Another yep. thing, when Donald Trump, the, 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 uh, the reporter said, Mr. Mr. President, 250,000 people have died from COVID so far this year. Do you remember, do you remember what he said? It no. is what it is. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. You don't remember that? Yeah. It is what Ugh. it is. Okay. Hey, uh, your, your son just jumped off a building and killed himself. You look at me and say, it is what it is. Yeah. 10,000 people have drowned from a hurricane in Mississippi. And some are still drowning. They're still counting bodies. And you say, it is what it is. Yep. The president of the United States was told 250,000 people have died so far. So far means they're still dying. And his response was, it is what it is. What it is mean, if I tell your son just died and you say it is, it means so what? He turned and told the people on national TV, it is what it is, so what? And the yep. people still don't understand what he just said. He just said he don't give a damn. But you know why he don't? Because them people dead, they don't vote. That's why he don't care about them. And he don't, he himself don't understand what he's saying. But that's the way he is. He doesn't care. One other thing. Uh, this reporter, I don't know if you saw this. This reporter said, Mr. President, when he shut down the government, Mr. President, I wrote all these down, but it's, it's at my house. And I got the names and the, the dates and who was, what uh, TV station it was on and everything. But she said, Mr. President... Are you concerned, just when you shut the government down, are you concerned about the people that are um, going to lose their houses, their apartments, their cars from the shutdown? And he said, on national TV, this ain't something that I'm telling you, I heard he said, or I seen he said, he said this on national TV. No, I'm not concerned about them. Somebody must have said in his, in his group, you, you, you can't say that. And then he yeah. walked a couple of steps, then turned around and said, they're mostly Democrats. The man just told the whole world and the whole everybody in the United States, 
he don't care about half of the country. And he said they're mostly Democrats. So he just told the Republicans, I don't care about you either. I don't care about you either. <laughs> and that's on TV. That's on, he said that on national TV. But this is that's what gets that me, can, Robert. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't hide who he is. He doesn't try to and pretend still, he's a better I, man I than he is, and, and people and still and follow him. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't think a lot of them understand what he's saying when he says those things. Because yeah. um, when he said, no, I'm not concerned about them. They're mostly Democrats. That's half the people in the, in the country. He just said he don't care about yeah. And not only them, he said they're mostly Democrats. He don't care about the Republicans either. But this is what you <laughs> got to look for, for past that and see. When he said, no, I don't care about them. They're mostly Democrats. He just told yeah. all those soldiers fighting in Afghanistan and everywhere else in the world, if you're a Democrat, I don't care about you. And some of you Republicans, I don't care about you. Either. And they're coming back with the missing arms and legs. And they're coming yeah. back dead. They're coming back with Yeah, make guns. sure they don't come to my public them, appearances because Democrat, nobody wants to see that. Me. Yeah. Robert, thank you so much for the well, call. The, Great to talk to you. Um, we need That's to take a quick break. Uh, we will be back with more calls right after this. Podcasts of Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive, are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Just search WCPT 820. Hey, Google, play WCPT. Streaming Chicago's progressive talk from TuneIn. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. We are spending the first hour of this day taking your calls, and I want to let you know from 3 to 3.30, once we um, wrap this segment up, we're going to be talking to Tom Hartman. He has a new book out called The Hidden History of the American Dream, and we will be um, spending some time with Tom talking about that. But let's go back to the phone lines. Greg's on the line from Lake in the Hills. Hey, Greg, how are you? Greg, can you hear me? Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay, Lady B, let's put Greg on hold and and go to Bobby, who's on the line from Indiana. Hey, Bobby, how are you? Oh, John. Hi, Hello. how are you? Oh, not too bad. Good. Um, That's what I like to hear, Bobby. Well, um, in my book, um, Vance uh, still lost the debate by... <laughs> Well, he should have done it with all of his lies, but he certainly did sink his own ship with the uh, January 6th and not being able to answer uh, whether or not uh, he would, uh, you know, go by uh, uh, the results of the election when the time would come. So so he lost, and that's plain and simple. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, well, today was the uh, the uh, the grand uh, finale. I uh, talked to voter registration, and they indeed received by ballot. Back Yay! In the and um, and I also made out my final check to the Harris campaign. So, uh, Bobby, so you're a good man. I've gone as far as I can. I've hit the bumping post for this election pretty much. Other than telling people, you know, get out there and work for the right people. That's right. That's right. Um, oh, left out. You know, a, lo- um, a while ago, pre-pandemic, I used to be a rower. I would row crew. Um, and one thing I learned when we were racing was even if it's a long race, you have to, from the very first second you start, each stroke, you have to give it everything you've got. You have to give it everything, and when you cross that finish line, I, I don't know if you've ever watched a rowing race. A lot of times they cross the finish line, and you see everybody in the boat just slump over. 
just literally like slumping over, trying to catch their breath, trying to recover some of their muscles because the only way to do well in a race, you can't just start off and say, well, I'm going to pace myself and then in the last few minutes I'm going to give it everything. If you really want to do well, you have to give it everything from the second you cross the start line. And that's what I feel this election is like. We have to give it everything we've got. Because, you know, we may not get another chance to do this if Donald Trump gets elected into the White House. He's already told us he's going to dismantle everything he can dismantle and set himself up to stay in power. He's clear about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah, you're right. He's um, He made it, uh, you know. As the saying goes, blatantly obvious what he intends to do, given the opportunity. And as every, everybody with a uh, movable brain should know that um, he is a person that should not be given any opportunities, quite frankly, in, in any field. Uh, and certainly not not the leader of the alleged free world because it won't be free after that. Hmm. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's the, uh, that's the news from Indiana today. That's my little nugget for today. (laughs) If I see or hear anything, I'll let you know. Thank you, Bobby. We will count on that. And I appreciate the call. Uh, let's go to Franklin Park. Al is on the line. Hello, Al. How are you today? Thanks for calling in. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, Joan. Uh, I just called to say a little bit about voting. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, mainly, I know that we get all our ballots, you know, are held, you know, first by the Cook County website. And I'm still waiting for that ballot to show up for, uh, you know, uh uh, Franklin Park, and it hasn't shown up, and I don't know if it showed up yet for the county. And also the fact that, uh, you know, I, right now I can go to vote.org, and it did give me a ballot, but it was real incomplete ballot. It doesn't have any of the, the judges or uh, 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 all the information on it. And so, you know, it's all. I'm just going to say it's important, you know, we to to get the information from the county website, and then, you know, I I'm curious how how uh, like uh, uh, vote dot org and ballot Paluta, is that did I say that right? Get their information, and, you know, kind of is interesting as well. Yeah, so Ballotpedia. That just, that, that's mostly um, information that's available. Publicly, you can you can go to Ballotpedia and find out who is on the ballot. Um, I I live in Cook County, and I'm one of those people who signed up to permanently vote by mail. And mm-hmm. I know that if you live in the city of Chicago, those ballots started being mailed out last week, either the beginning of last week or the end of the week before. But mm-hmm. um, I have not. I've not received my ballot, but then this is usually the way it goes, because I remember every election right when I start to panic, Al, Mm -hmm. and think, oh, my God, something's wrong. I'm not getting my ballot. This has taken this has taken too long. Usually within two to three days after I melt down with panic, that's when my ballot shows up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, correct. I just, you know, think it's it's good to. Uh, you, you know, help you figure out where to vote. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, uh, in the state of Illinois, uh, each senatorial district has two representative districts in it. And, you know, they they they're, uh, uh, they overlap each other perfectly. You know, thing, things like that. Yeah. So. Well, keep me posted, okay? Uh, all right. Uh, uh, thank you, Joan. Thank you. Uh, Let's go to our good friend, Paul, who's on the line from Seattle. Hey, Paul. Hi, Joan. I think the word that you're looking for for J.D. Vance is unctuous. Yes. 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 That's a very good word. 
Yeah, that's, that's J.D. Vance all over. And I, I think you're right um, now that I think about it. Although I don't think he was on beta blockers. It would have been some benzodiazepine like Xanax or Ativan or Lorazepam or Valium. Something like that would take the edge off so that you can just seem relaxed and uncombative. And it's nothing that would, you, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't rise to the excitement mm-hmm. of conflict. It was just like, huh, huh, okay, well, nice. Um, but, yeah. And, you know, for people, I, I know this from my days as a media trainer. There are some people who are just simply really terrified of any public speaking, and sometimes doctors will actually prescribe a beta blocker, which is a drug that kind of just makes it really impossible to feel scared, um, impossible to be to be anxious, at least for a limited amount of time. Now, there are side effects, and not everybody likes uh, the way that makes them feel, but J.D. Vance, man, oh, man, I... um, he just, he seemed, I don't know, Paul, part of it makes me, um, I wonder though, because like I said, Tim Walls spoke first and he was clearly very nervous. He was kind of, kind of a little shaky in that first answer. And I don't know if that, you know, made J.D. Vance think, <laughs> I got this. I'm just, you know, if nothing else, I, I'm going to be cool, calm and collected. I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I don't well, know I- enough about it. I don't know why, you know, it's just interviewing 101 is that the first, yeah, you're nervous when you go into the interview. And normally what they teach you is just whatever the question is, if you don't think you have a handle on it, here's your, here's your answer to whatever. Here's the first thing you're going to say. Just say this, right? Mm-hmm. And if, whether, this, whether it's actually answering the question, you don't have to be so wonky about it. Just, just say this, and that's your opening remark, and, it, and you've you got it down. But I, I just, you know, I, I think that I think you're right. Tim Walls was, he was playing for the team, and he wasn't out there to start mm-hmm. a fight or anything. He was out there to come across as, you know, more appealing. And I have to ask the truck driver, uh, Texter, what policies is he talking about? The, the Trump. I mean, Trump, yeah. the Trump administration passed <sighs> no legislation. Right. Uh, let's and even when and he was none. asked recently about his. Um, I think it was about health care, and, and that what he gave the answer. Well, he didn't have a plan, but he had a con- he had concepts. He had concepts. Yeah, I mean, there was, and he also okay. said that JD Vance. If I were Tim Walton, this is why I thought he's he's not jumping on it. When JD Vance about climate change, he goes, well, if you believe in climate change, yeah, if you happen to live in Asheville, North, North Carolina, and if you believe in climate change because your town is underwater by about twenty feet, uh, then you're going to certainly want it. And then he describes essentially. The Democratic plan and says, this is our plan. I mean, no, yep. no, no it's just, it was just all, it was what you had said before that he, he kind of said nothing. If anything, it was more the Democratic response, but it was mostly nothing. Like you said, you, 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 you go, what the hell did he say? Right. It was, it was one of those answers. That, and he kept saying, if you believe it, and of course it was the, the uh, Kamala Harris open borders policy has done this and that and the other thing. And I don't know, Tim Walls was, he didn't take an opportunity to, you know, to say, well, here you go again or anything like that. Yeah. He was just trying to get, but again, to this truck driver, what policies in the Trump administration, they couldn't even get funding for Trump's wall from the Republican Congress. When he took over as president, he had both houses of Congress, couldn't get funding for his wall. Yeah. He couldn't get it from them. Yeah, I so think that the there, the people, um, maybe the people who supported Trump before are just in lockstep. Maybe because uh, this truck driver isn't uh, keeping up with current events. Or, you know, maybe it's a more base reason. He sees a white Christian nationalist regime being put in place under Donald Trump, and that appeals to him. I, I don't know. I can't figure well, out Donald Trump, what, what Donald appeals Trump. to people. When they say they're they're voting for Trump, I I I am very puzzled. I am very puzzled by that. They think Maybe. they seem to they seem to believe a lot of things that aren't true. Oh, he was good for the economy. No, he wasn't. Oh, well, he was good on this. No, he wasn't. Um, you know, it's like they they well, how about this one? they only watch Fox and they believe everything that uh, Sean Hannity tells them. When even if you look at uh, Sean Hannity's. Um, <laughs> own texts, Sean Hannity doesn't believe what Sean Hannity says. Well, Donald Trump, 
put Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. This truck driver should know this. Neil Gorsuch, when he was a judge in Colorado, found against a truck driver who left his disabled rig in a snowstorm because he was freezing to death and he was fired for leaving his rig and seeking to save his own wife. Neil Gorsuch ruled against him. And Neil Gorsuch so, was Donald Trump's guy. Trump's the point, exactly. Oh, we've got to go. I've got to get to news. Um, sorry I didn't get to all of the callers today. Uh, we are going to be spending the whole first half of the show tomorrow uh, taking calls. So if you didn't get through today, please call me back tomorrow. We're going to take a break for news. We'll be back with more after this. WCPT 820, Chicago's progressive talk, where facts matter. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive. The reason that I listen to you from the infamous other side, you will call a spade a spade, and if it's indefensible, you will not defend it. And you know what? I can respect that. On WCPT 820. We are very fortunate to be joined by Tom Hartman, midday host here at WCPT. Uh, Sirius XM Freedom TV, um, Twitter Live star. He's on every platform. And he is going to be with Richard Chu doing a live panel next Wednesday, the 9th. He is also going to be making some bookstore appearances in the area because he has a new book out. The Hidden History of the American Dream. Tom, how are you? Hey, Joan. Great talking with you again. It's just been a couple of weeks. I know. I know. You know, I've started watching you on uh, Twitter Live. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't even know that you were uh, on that particular platform. You really, these days, if you want to get this kind of democratic, progressive message out, in, in the words that have become a cliche, you kind of have to go where the people are, don't you? Yeah, yeah. The, the the ones we haven't figured out yet that we really need to are uh, TikTok and, and mm-hmm. Instagram. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we have a we have a presence there, but we haven't really professionalized it. And, but yeah, you're right. Uh, but you know, I, I I still love old fashioned radio, and I'm so glad to be on WCPT. I I think you know people driving in their cars or sitting at home listening to radio. That's that's where I started, and that's where mm-hmm. I'm going to plant my yeah. flag till the day I die. I I know what you, I know what you mean. It's it's such a well, you know, <laughs> maybe not everybody views it this way, but it feels to me like it's such a vibrant medium. It there's an immediacy, there's an intimacy to radio that I really like. Yeah, yeah I used to make the the analogy that uh, when I was teaching, uh, you know, media or advertising and marketing and PR is that television is like voyeurism. It's like, you know, you're sitting in your living room looking through your picture window into somebody else's house. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas radio is like a phone call. It's your friend talking in your ear. You know, it's Mm -hmm. immediate right there. And the mediums are very, very different. Television is very cold. Radio is very hot or warm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I really, um, I always enjoy your books, but... I, I particularly enjoyed in this new book, Hidden History of the American Dream, The Demise of the Middle Class and How to Rescue Our Future. <laughs> I think at some point you've just simply decided to be very straightforward in the way you label your chapters. For instance, one chapter is, for the next time some idiot tries to tell you the GOP is the party of business. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that because, you know, let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not, you know, try to say, well, we're going to refute these uh, economic arguments. No, if because it drives me crazy, because as I'm sure you hear and I hear, well, you know, Trump was really good for the economy. Republicans are really good for the economy. Um, no, actually, no, actually, that's not the case. Talk about that yeah, chapter Jimmy if you would. Did better. Yeah, Jimmy Carter did better than uh, Donald Trump did on the economy. Well, you know, the bottom line is the Republican Party are, uh, you know, they, they reflect the desires and needs of the billionaire class and to some extent the very, very large corporations that make the billionaire class. And, uh, and in particular, the fossil fuel industry, although there are a few other industries that 
you know, the, the uh, health insurance industry, the banking industry, um, the, uh, the drug industry that are all also basically, you know, own large chunks of the Republican Party and, and to whose tune the Republican Party dances. But, you know, the bottom line is that the GOP is not the party of business they, they, because, uh, you know, they're basically the, the party of predators. And uh, those predators do not help business in general. Uh, they may help some small number of businesses, but not business. And they certainly don't help the American middle class. Uh, they're destroying yeah. the American dream, in fact. So, yeah. Well, I just, um, I spend the first hour of the show just reading texts and taking calls. And I got a text from a truck driver who said he was dictating it with hands free while he was driving. And he was like, well, you know, you know, Trump and Vance are my guys are going to win. And my question was, why are they your guys? If you're a Teamster truck driver, do you think Donald Trump is going to be good for your union or any union? Um, if you're not a member of a union you're, and you're just a middle class guy, do you think that he is going to be good for you economically, that he's not going to use people like you and me to squeeze us more so that there will be more tax cuts for the billionaire class? I don't understand understand that, that whole m- mindset that I've heard before from rank and file, from unions, that somehow Donald Trump is their guy. Where does that come from, Tom, and how do we get them away from it? Well, if you hate black people, Donald Trump's your guy. If you hate Muslims, Donald Trump's your guy. If you hate Hispanics, Donald Trump's your guy. If you think that men should have a free license to rape women whenever they want to uh, and, and not suffer any consequences from it, uh, Donald Trump's your guy. Uh, you know, if, if, if you think that uh, gay people should stay in the closet, Donald Trump's your guy. You know, generally speaking, if you're an ass, forgive the phrase, Donald Trump's your guy. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I mean, <laughs> what did Trump do for truck drivers? Absolutely nothing. No. You know, Trump, A, doesn't want them to have unions. In fact, he, he was, he was uh, you know, when he was being interviewed by Elon Musk a couple of weeks ago, he said, boy, I really admire, I'm, I'm paraphrasing mm-hmm. here, so you can find the exact words online, but he said, boy, I really admire how you fire people when they try to start a union. He says, yeah. they just say, I want a union, and you just fire them. I mean, he was, he, he was very impressed by that. He has never... Uh, allowed unionization within his own organizations or his own companies. Um, I mean, you know, maybe he, had, he was forced to with the with the uh, casinos. I don't know, frankly. But um, you know, we know that Trump hates unions. Um, we know that Trump screws average working people. There's over 3,500 small businesses, truck drivers, by the way, delivery services, and you know, construction workers, uh, contractors who have. Sued Donald Trump for refusing to pay them, which means that there's probably another ten thousand out there who just shrugged their shoulders and said, "Screw it, it's not worth it." Who, you know, because you can't, uh, you know, you, you sue Donald Trump and he'll just sue you back, and then and then you know it costs you more than if you'd gotten the money from him. I had a guy who did uh, much of the cabinet work in one of the uh, one of his casinos in New Jersey call into my program last year, and uh, he said that Donald Trump owed him, 100 and, I think it was 135000 maybe it was $185,000, and he said he, he uh, looked into suing him to get it, and his lawyer reached out to Trump's lawyers, and Trump's lawyers said, uh, you know, you should be happy that you were able to put on your on your uh, uh, ab- in your advertising and on your resume that you worked in a Trump property. The, the, there's one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars worth of prestige there. And by the way, if you sue us, we will sue you back, and it will cost you more than one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars to defend yourself against our frivolous lawsuit. So you know, mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. vouch for the veracity of that claim, but you know, that's well, basically no, what that's the guy a story said. from other folks I've heard over and over again. In one of his properties, there was a company that was hired to install chandeliers, and uh, Donald Trump's uh, business refused to pay the bill. Only the story, as it was published in New York, that guy brought his employees back. They took all the chandeliers out and they left with them. But not, not everybody <laughs> can do that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, so you know, anybody who, uh, when somebody tells you that Donald Trump is their guy, what they're telling you is that they're they're basically a you know a racist, misogynistic uh, ass, or they're just pathetically uninformed. I mean, it's just I, I don't see any al- any other alternative. 
It does seem like we've gotten to this point. Why did you decide to write this particular book now? Because the American middle class has been under assault for half of my lifetime. And I, you know, I was, uh, I was born in 1951. So I saw this country become a middle class country in the 1950s and 60s. And then I saw Ronald Reagan come into office in 1981 and deconstruct the middle class. I start the book out with, in the introduction, um, talking about how when my generation was in our 30s, um, and 40s in the in the late 80s, early 90s, um, we controlled 21 percent, roughly, of the uh, national wealth of the entire GDP of the United States. We we control about 21 percent of all the country's money. Now, the generation that is in their 30s and early 40s control around five, actually less than five percent, 4.6 percent of the nation's wealth. So we've seen this almost fourfold reduction in the wealth held by the American middle class. Where did that money go? It went to the top 1%. It went Mm -hmm. to the billionaire class. $51 $51 trillion transfer of wealth, 100% of it the result of Republican policies, principally tax cuts like Donald Trump's tax cut, George Bush's tax cut, and Ronald Reagan's tax cuts, but also the hostility of all three of those uh, uh, administrations to unions. Donald Trump put Anthony Scalia's son in charge of the Labor Department. He, this is a guy who made his living busting unions. I mean, you know, you've got a guy yep. who hates labor, organized labor, in charge of the labor department. That's Donald Trump, right? So, anyhow, I, what we're what we're seeing, and and you know, arguably, this started out with good intentions. I, I think the whole Republican destroy the middle class thing that started in the '80s um, really, uh, you know. You can reach back, and I think you and I may have discussed this in the past, Joe, because I've written about it before. You know, back in 1951, Russell Kirk published this book, The Conservative Mind, in which he said, you know, okay, in in 51, we were on our way to becoming the first democracy in the world where 50% of the people in the country were living in the middle class. We weren't quite there yet, but we were getting there. And Russell Kirk was saying, um, you know, look out. If the middle class gets too large, I mean, you know, our, in fact, his, the subtitle of his book was From Burke to Elliot. That's Edmund Burke to T.S. Eliot, who, two famous conservatives. But Edmund Burke, in the, it was it, around the time of the American Revolution, was a British conservative. And he, you know, famously uh, defended England's maximum wage laws. They had, they had laws in England at that time that said that employers couldn't pay more than a certain amount because they didn't want a middle class to emerge because they were afraid that if a middle class ever emerged, those those people are not educated. They, 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 they didn't come from wealth. They have no experience in governance, and they'll just screw the country up. And so you want to keep the poor poor. And so anyhow, uh, Russell Kirk said, you know, if the middle class ever gets too large, basically what you're going to see is young people uh, no longer respecting their elders, women no longer knowing their their place in society and and no longer respecting their husbands, and racial minorities and religious minorities, um, you know, demanding equality with uh, white Christians, basically. I mean, I'm I'm being a little more blunt in my language Mm -hmm. than he was. And um, when he published his when he when he published that book in fifty one, most Republicans uh, just didn't take it seriously. They thought he was a crack a crackpot, except for uh, William F. Buckley and Barry Goldwater. They got all excited about it. But then the sixties happened, and you had the birth control pill and the women's movement. You had the civil rights movement hitting its peak, and in fact, in some cases, you know, after King's uh, murder, uh, burning our cities, and you had young men saying, hell no, I'm not going to go to Vietnam. And Republicans looked around and said, holy cow, Russell Kirk was a prophet. And so when Reagan came into office in 81, his mandate was to destroy or cut down the size of the middle class. At that time, the middle class was two-thirds of us when Reagan came into office. And he was successful. It's only 43% of us now. Um, so he ha- and, and, and to stay in the middle class now, you have to have two incomes, whereas when mm-hmm. Reagan came into office, to do it with one income. So that, there's that fourfold reduction in wealth. You know, they, they, they reduced the number of people in the middle class, and then they doubled the amount, the number of people working that it takes to, to stay in the middle class. And most Americans have no idea that this happened. You know, they, they know that they've been screwed. They're not sure how or by whom. Um, so I wanted to write a book that would lay it out. Yeah. And part of that is not only keep them down economically, but keep them ignorant. You write a whole chapter on why public schools are on the GOP hit list. Talk about that. Yeah, Republicans 
have uh, are conser- I should say conservatives. I mean, again, this goes back to Edmund Burke, who, who was no fan of public education. Um, and re- Republicans have long believed that, uh, you know, having a class of uh, uneducated poor people is actually a good thing for society. That poverty is a good thing for society. We, you know, we have a, out of the 34 OECD countries, the most developed countries in the world, we have the worst poverty problem. And it's because this, of this conservative belief that if you keep large numbers of people in poverty, what you are doing is you are providing a desperate labor force who are willing to work for low wages. And this is why when you look at, at when you look at blue states and democratically controlled states, you see, you know, uh, average wages in the 20, you know, starting wages of 20 bucks an hour. I mean, in a lot of places, you've got a minimum wage of 15 to 20 dollars an hour in a lot of cities and states. Um, whereas and, 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 and people, you know, a lot of people living in the middle class and, and being quite prosperous. On the other hand, when you look at the red states, the Republican controlled states, they're pretty much across the board. I mean, you know, Montana might be the exception of this, but by and large, what you see is just enormous amounts of poverty. And this is the way that the Republicans want it. It's not, you know, people say, well, why don't they do something about the poverty? Well, what that poverty does is it, is it produces people who are willing to work in a factory for $13 an hour and, 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 and will not try to unionize, uh, particularly because the red states are all right to work for less states, so it's even harder to unionize anyway. Um, and and to keep it in. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, I want to know, one of your chapters, I want to sign up to help make this happen. I don't know if we do like a change.org petition or uh, pass some laws. I believe Congress members should wear NASCAR patches. I think there should be a jacket with all of the patches for all of the people who are funding them, and they have to wear it, if not on the actual floor, at least if they come out to the microphones to do television or, uh, or, or internet interviews. I like this idea. Let's make them show us with their clothing who's buying them, who's paying for them. Yeah, here's a here's a funny story. Uh, Lewis Powell, the guy who wrote the Powell memo and who also wrote the, the First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti decision that in 1978 established corporate personhood and said that corporations can bribe politicians and it's no longer a bribe. It's now called free speech. When he was inducted into the Supreme Court, Nixon put him on the Supreme Court in 71, when he was sworn in. The Federalist Society people gave him a black robe that was covered with the logos of a whole bunch of big corporations. And these were all corporations that actually support that he had worked for. He was a corporate lawyer. He'd worked for Philip Morris. And it was the Philip Morris, actually, it was the Philip Morris president who gave him the robe. And all the, the patches on it were Philip Morris brands. And they own Kraft Foods and they, you know, they own all these, you know, they own a hundred, uh, over a hundred companies, I think. And, uh, so yeah. But, but that chapter actually is kind of a rewrite of a chapter. That was one of the 11 chapters in a book that I wrote back in 2008 called Rebooting the American Dream, which was kind of an agenda for the Obama administration. And there was a chapter in there called, you know, uh, legislators should wear NASCAR patches. And Bernie Sanders read that out loud into the congressional record on the floor of the Senate <laughs> when he did that filibuster. So, yeah. I know you've got you. a, had a long relationship with Bernie Sanders. Who else do you think is operating at the national level who is somebody we should really be uh, paying attention to? I, I my my favorite senators are, are Bernie, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, and Elizabeth Warren. Those, those three are the most. Uh, and and oh, and uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, oh man, brain fart. Um, my two senators, Ron Wyden and uh, Jeff, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only Jeff I can think uh, of right now is Jeff Flake, and I know that's not who you're Jeff, talking no, about. Jeff, Jeff Merkley. Yeah, it's Jeff oh. Merkley. I'm sorry. It, it, it comes to you after a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, hey, but, I'm there. Uh, you know, yeah, those, those five are are absolutely brilliant. You know, Ron Wyden just proposed uh, the legislation to expand the size of the Supreme Court, and Jeff Merkley is really a good, solid progressive, and he's been doing some great work. It, it, neither of them have quite the national profile of 
of because uh, they've never run for president, you know, of Elizabeth Warren uh, or Bernie Sanders. But uh, and Sheldon Whitehouse, of course, has just been taking it to the Supreme Court for years now. And I, I think he, you know, uh, if Harris is elected, uh, he should be given a job as the attorney general. He should replace Merrick Garland. I think somebody's got to replace Merrick Garland. I mean, you know, he might have been a great Supreme Court jurist, but I've always thought that the person who's head of the DOJ needs a little bit of the prosecutor about them. And if he ever was a prosecutor, he certainly, I think, lost that DNA somewhere uh, along the lines in his career. Um, yeah, no. That caution, which makes mm-hmm. you a good judge. Yeah, you almost a, a both. In the beginning, I almost felt that it was a little bit of a both sidesing, which really mm. disturbed me. And I don't feel quite that uh, that kind of disappointment now. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that um, is being pursued against Donald Trump was there when Merrick Garland took over the DOJ and pretty much for a full year or more. There was no action taken, and I still, I I mean, I don't pretend to know the inner workings of the DOJ. Maybe there are things going on that explain away that delay, but I sure don't understand it. I don't know if you have any insight into it. Uh, Yeah, I've heard a bunch of different stories, and sometimes they conflict. One of the stories that pops up frequently is that when Garland took over the Department of Justice, that it had already been severely corrupted by Bill Barr and Donald Trump, and they had packed the senior levels of the DOJ with you know, Republicans and right-wing shills and whatnot who just fought and fought and fought uh, tooth and nail to prevent any kind of uh, holding of Donald Trump responsible. Um, on the other hand, I've also heard that Merrick Garland was afraid of being seen as partisan. He did not want to politicize the Department of Justice. He wanted to take it back uh, to the pre-Trump days of, you know, being an independent agency. And he thought that would hurt its appearance. Uh, that was a terrible miscalculation if that was the case. But I don't. I, I just don't know. I. I, I am not. Uh, he's been doing good the last couple of years, and and God bless him. You know, keep keep going. But so many of Trump's crimes, uh, you know, for example, his Hatch Act violations. I mean, he should have been prosecuted for those just so nobody else would do them. You yeah. know, I don't care if you get a conviction. Just just file the file exactly. the damn papers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's what I've said so. to the listeners all along. You know, the goal isn't that we want a certain outcome, that Donald Trump has to go to jail, but the fact that the legal system calls him into a courtroom, holds his feet to the fire. That's the important part. That's that's our legal system working and the whole nobody's above the law kind of kind of an attitude, whether, you know, a jury or a judge convicts him or doesn't convict him. You know, that's wonderful. But just the fact that he was forced to give an accounting of his behavior, that's, you know, I mean, let's face it, Tom, if you and I did a third of what Donald Trump has done, we would be wearing orange jumpsuits right now. We'd be doing this from the prison radio station. Yeah, and the DOJ went after Hunter Biden. Why haven't they gone after Jared Kushner? He walked off mm-hmm. with $2 billion. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's what's up with that? You know? yep. Hey, um, I want to let everybody know Tom is going to be at Frugal Muse Books um, on the 9th. That is in Darien, Illinois. Are you going to be doing a reading, a signing? Yeah, all of the above. And uh, please call first and let them know you're coming. I, uh, in fact, we heard from them that they think that they're going to be swamped. So okay. uh, I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but uh, call and let them know first. Okay, that's Fru- Frugal Muse Books in Darien, Illinois. And uh, that same day, you'll be able to hear Tom not only during the Tom Hartman show, but also for part of the Joan Esposito show when he and the lovely Richard Chu uh, conduct one of our famous panels um, and uh, have some fun with that. I know you always do. You bring a voice yeah. of reason to some of our um, more hyperbolic rantings. I, well, I, I, you know, those labor panels are a lot of fun, and it's great yeah. hanging out with a bunch of union guys. My, you know, I'm a union guy. I'm, I'm in sag after my uh, my dad, uh, you know, got into the middle class because of the machinist union. That was, it was just that simple. So. You know, I'm I'm a fan of the unions. Me too. I'm also a SAG-AFTRA member. 
have been for more years than I'm willing to admit right now. Uh, Tom Hartman's new book is The Hidden History of the American Dream. Uh, it is out now. You should look for it. You should get it. And you should, if you can get squeeze in to the frugal muse in Darien, you should go uh, get your copy signed. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. Always a pleasure. Well, thank you, Joan. It's always, it's always such an honor to be on your program and a pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's, you're very kind to say that. We're going to take a break. We are going to be back with uh, Indivisible Chicago and uh, the Indivisible Chicago former podcaster right after this. Now back to Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. One of our favorite politically interested human beings in Chicago is Tom Moss. You used to hear him here on WCPT when we used to uh, replay the uh, Indivisible Chicago podcast. Tom is not doing that these days, but he hasn't given up his love and passion for politics. Tom, how are you? It's been too long. It has been too long, Joan. I'm doing great, and it's uh, good to hear you. Good to be with you. So um, what's the, what have you been doing this summer? Oh, gosh, just, uh, you know, a uh, little hand-wringing, a little sweating, um, a little crying, a little gnashing of teeth. But, you know, actually, actually not. And that's one thing that I, I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit today. Um, there's a lot of anxiety out there. I was just talking to a, a friend of mine by text this morning. He said his wife is just beside herself. She she sees every headline in the New York Times, which is, you know, something else we can talk about, uh, and all these, you know, all these papers and every little glitch in the campaign, um, you know, causes apoplexy. And boy, I get it. I mean, I'm, I'm there, too. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I think a point I want to make right up front is that wringing hands and gnashing of teeth and rending of garments doesn't do a darn thing except make us afraid. But getting involved uh, is the one thing that we do have control over. And if I can just put an early pitch in here for IndivisibleChicago.com, if you want to canvas, if you want to make phone calls, if you want to write postcards, if you want to give money, even uh, even the money is going to, to help, uh, that's the place you can find out how you can uh, uh, do a little less uh, hand-wringing and a little more door-knocking, you know, make those hands a little more useful. Uh, so IndivisibleChicago.com is where folks can go to get involved. And, you know... It's it's anxiety and it's all of these other really strong feelings because um, I saw this in 2022. I saw this in 2020 when we get close to a really contentious election. People, uh, to put it kindly, and I, I've said this before, people get a lot more passionate, but people really yeah. get wound up and uh i know it's going to get worse before it gets better um but you know i i hear i hear you you know i mean i feel the same way that um your significant other feels you know i vacillate between being really confident that we're going to start um with kamala harris for this wonderful wonderful world um, where, you know, we care about people, um, like we used to, or at least, uh, at least it seemed to me like we used to, and all these wonderful, great things. And then I think, well, yes, but, you know, you felt, you felt this way when Hillary was running. <laughs> you know, you can't trust your feelings. And then I go, I ah! know. Kind of like that. <laughs> it's kind of, a, that's kind of the noise I make psychologically. I, I am with you. I make that I make that noise right out loud. Sometimes in the middle of the night, you know. I mean, I think you know. This is this is two things I know to be true about polls. For instance, number one is that polls are not predictive. Uh, they're sometimes so wrong as to actually be irrelevant. I know that we should not be paying that much attention to polls. That's one thing I know. The other thing I know is I cannot stop looking at the polls. <laughs> and so, you know, I'll watch Nate Cohn's, you know, he's my, my favorite poll aggregator at the moment. And when Harris's number goes up to 50%, I'm like, oh, my God, okay, we're going to win this. And if it dips down to 49.7% or whatever, I think we're doomed. Uh, and that, that, of course, is not a healthy thing. But look, I mean, the, the thing I told my friend today, 
is what's new? What's new about this particular news cycle? Uh, we knew it was a tight race. We knew it was going to be close. We know that there's a bunch of people that are are buying uh, what my dad would call Trump's happy horse S. And, uh, you know, for reasons that we may not be able to understand, that's all stuff we've known. And, um, you know, what's important is the next 30 days doing, you know, everything we can is, Coach Wall says, uh, you know, we'll sleep when we're dead. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, Tom Moss and I are going to take a real quick break. We're going to continue talking politics and how we can make the future we want to actually happen and all that and more right after this. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen on SoundCloud or iTunes. Just search WCPT 820. Joan Esposito. Live, local, and progressive. This is WCPT 820, where facts matter. Attention, everyone. Don't turn that dial. Joan Esposito. Live, local, and progressive. Returns right now on WCPT 820. And I am joined by Tom Moss, who gave you the information you need to be a part of Indivisible, and especially Indivisible Chicago. I've told you before, uh, you can get a daily email of, it's always at least two things you can do. And oftentimes, the things that you can do to help ballot measures, to help candidates, are things you can do from the comfort of your own home. So please sign up for that um, and uh, and consider. And if it's something like canvassing, there's usually a link um, to help you figure out how to do it with uh, some people who will probably be your new best friends. Tom, what... I know we've got stuff going on locally um, in the Chicago area. You know, we got this CPS contract, all the controversy over ShotSpider. We have stuff going on nationally. You know, uh, 10 states across the country have abortion-related ballot measures um, on the November ballot. What are the, say, the top three issues, the things that y- on a daily basis you keep an eye on? Well, you know, my day job is in higher education, and um, that is certainly one of the key things that I pay attention to professionally and just personally. It's a it's a passion. Um, I heard you talking with Tom Hartman before I came on, and uh, he made the point, and I was glad to hear it made, and I don't hear it talked about enough, that um, the defunding, the distancing of um, of public education funding is not an accident. It's a strategy, and it's been mm-hmm. a very effective one. Uh, we see it at the K-12, through and we see it in higher education as well. So um, those issues are, are huge. And, um, you know, the, the budgets of universities across the state, across the country, um, are a huge problem, um, especially as we move into a new kind of a economy uh, that we don't know what the ramifications of AI are going to be yet. Um, I tell my friends in the humanities that they're really missing an opportunity to uh, reframe what they do as, I don't know if we want to call it organic intelligence or, or, or natural intelligence, but it's certainly not artificial intelligence. And um, unless we're going to give up the ghost and uh, just pretend that humanity and humans don't matter, um, we've got to do a better job of, uh, of talking about ourselves. So that's that's one thing uh, that I that I think about. Um, you know, my uh, I have uh, friends, and my my wife is a, a social worker, so um, I certainly think about how um, you know. And certainly, education comes into play there as well. But um, the safety nets that we have in place. For uh, for our fellow citizens um, are just not enough, and so you know I, I do try to keep an eye on that as well. And um, you know I, I also volunteer at a food pantry, and um, you know uh, when I first started, there were a lot of uh, unhoused people that were coming through the line getting food, um, and now a lot of the, most of the people that are coming through, many of the people are are the migrant community. And I was thinking about this actually Tuesday night when I was volunteering and watching those folks come through. They were families, they were babies, they were children, they were young people. Um, I did not identify a single 
drug dealer among them or rapist no? or any of the things that, uh, that our former president would like us to, and our current vice presidential candidate would like us to believe about these people. I saw desperation. I saw people who mm-hmm. were willing to risk everything to escape their situation where they were. And, uh, you know, if you're following anything about Venezuela, which I know you are, um, it ain't good. Yeah. And that's always, I think, you know, people who want to um, easily dismiss um, people who um, immigrate legally or illegally to this country. I mean, like like somehow they think the, the attitude is, oh, they're coming here because just, you know, they want free health care and they don't want to pay any taxes and this and, and they want to take. Do you think for a minute what it would take for you to completely uproot your life, walk away from your friends, your family, your neighborhood, you know, sometimes walking away with only what you can carry and 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 you think this is like that they're somehow think that there's a golden ticket um, and that they're doing it because they're lazy. I mean, you know, when you when you make it personal, like, you know, like for Joan Esposito, what would it take for you to uproot your life? I mean, I can't even I can't even imagine even if things were dire. Um, I mean, I didn't leave when Trump was president, though I must say Canada was looking pretty darn good there <laughs> for a while. Um, but imagine how bad things have to be, how desperate you have to be to get up and and walk across a border to another country to try to save your family. I mean, I, if if anybody thinks about it for more than a couple of minutes, you know, and, and especially because I think some of the people who've absorbed Republican talking points or Fox talking points, they don't really think it through. I had somebody say to me a while back, well, you know, I've heard that these illegals are, you know, are getting like free health care. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, I thought to myself, well, let's let's parse this. Let's say for some reason that you're not uh, a legal immigrant, that you don't have the required paperwork and your kid falls and breaks their arm. Are you saying that that kid shouldn't be able to go to a hospital and and get their broken arm fixed because their parents don't have the right papers? I mean, if you really think it through, I think a lot of people who have these knee-jerk beliefs, they don't really think about what it would look like in real life. And I'd like to think, and maybe I'm fooling myself, that a lot of them would find a lot more kindness in their hearts if they really thought of it in terms of people not this nameless um in not these nameless migrants that are i don't know they're coming for us yep yep well you know um that that former president paints a a picture with words and uh if you don't actually meet these folks or see these folks on any kind of a regular basis I mean, I guess you can believe whatever whatever you want. The thing that, that I always go back to, I mean, you said, you know, walk away from your life. I mean, a lot of these people are literally walking away from their life through the Northern Triangle of Central America, which is a no-person's land that is, is extremely dangerous. It's not just like walking across the street. And like you said, it's it can't be a matter of laziness. I guess the thing that, that also upsets me a little, no, more than a little bit, um, you know, my, my mother was, the kind of Christian that anybody would want to be and be glad to know. I mean, she really believed that, you know, there was, there was really only one tenet that, uh, that Christ believed in, and that was helping the poor and being kind to people. And she practiced that. Um, so when I hear purported Christians talking about fellow human beings with such disdain and such cruelty, uh, it's hard to square that circle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I, I agree with that. I, I absolutely agree with that. Do you think that abortion and um, trying to regain some kind of rights, trying to regain some kind of autonomy, that 
I I say sometimes that abortion for this younger generation is their Vietnam, the issue that actually affects them. It isn't theoretical. It isn't something that they're going to have to think about when, you know, they reach retirement age. It's something that affects the way they live right here, right now, just like um, for my generation. It was like, you know, which members of my high school class are going to get low numbers in the lottery and have to have to go to Vietnam <laughs> And I think that kind of up close and personal involvement in the world of politics is very motivating. What do you think will happen with the younger vote this time around? You know, I think, you know, back to our previous conversation about polling and how uh, they, they can sometimes be so wrong as to be irrelevant. I've often wondered how well the polls are picking up the, the young vote. Um, excuse me, the, the, the young, uh, young opinion. Um, I think there might be, you know, we talked about shy Trump voters uh, from uh, eight years ago. I wonder if there might be a hidden silent majority population that aren't being picked up in these polls. And we might be really surprised. I do absolutely agree with you. I think this is a motivator for young people. I want to, I almost said young women, but I, I, I take the point too, that young men are affected by this as well. Um, certainly not as much as women, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but it is something that, uh, that we care about for our, our, our nieces and our daughters and our, and our, you know, and, and their families. Um, you know, going back to high school, we all knew somebody who was affected by um, by abortion one way or another. And so I think this is something that affects people much more broadly than just, um, again, the Republicans would have you believe that this is a, you know, uh, abortion is a, 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 a birth control issue, which, of course, obviously is not. We've seen some really tragic examples of, of how yeah. it truly is a health care issue. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, um, what do you think about the aftermath of the vice presidential debate? <laughs> well, um, you know, I think the, the, the question, you know, is always in the aftermath is who won. And um, I think it kind of depends how you look at that. How so, you judge it. <laughs> um, yeah, how you judge it and what, and what you're looking for. So who was the smoothest, slickest operator who accomplished what they set out to accomplish almost flawlessly? And I think you'd have to admit that Vance did that. Of course, I'm not suggesting he didn't lie a little bit, maybe, along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly I don't agree with anything that came out of his mouth, but um, he certainly put a uh, happy face on a post liberal, weird think that um, that faction of Republicans, uh, that, that's why they embraced him in the first place. Uh, who got the soundbite? Walls got the soundbite. And I think that was, uh, a, a, you know, if you're, if you're judging how the, how the debate is, is potentially going to impact voters, I think Walls probably has an edge as far as that goes. Uh, Vance's audience was already all in. Walls might have brought a couple people over you know, it's, uh, and you look at the you look at the uh, polling again. Polling, so sorry, forgive me. But <laughs> you look at you look at the polling afterwards, and predictably, uh, all the Republicans, like ninety percent of Republicans, thought that Vance won. Ninety percent of um, Democrats thought that Walls won. But I thought what was really interesting, and I don't think you're you're hearing it talked about much. Independents broke for Walls by about ten percent. So it's a small number. It's a small number of a small mm-hmm. number, but. We're in the world where those small numbers can be the difference between President Harris and not President Harris. Um, Lady B, we have that uh, that soundbite after after the vice presidential debate, Tom. Um, and there was one reporter that was talking to some high school students and that got a lot of attention and that was pretty cool. But there was another reporter who uh, supposedly had uh, six unde- undecided undecided uh, voters with them. They, um, and after, well, what I saw on social media was, you know, they, I don't think most of them really wanted to commit even after the vice presidential debate, but one of them did. One of the quote-unquote undecided voters said that based on what they had seen, they were going to vote for Kamala, and they explained why. Go ahead and uh, play that, if you would, Lady B. And actually, I want to start with overall impressions, guys, because all seven of you came in undecided. One of you 
said they've made up their mind. Ryan, who do you who are you going to vote for, and, and what kind of solidified that opinion? Well, I'm going to be voting for Kamala Harris. You know, uh, one of the stark sort of aspects of that debate that really stuck with me was when they were talking about January 6th and how Mike Pence certified the election and they were wondering if J.D. Vance would certify the election should Trump lose. And, you know, J.D. Vance didn't really give us a definitive answer and I, I'm disappointed in that fact. And I don't think that I can trust someone, you know, with my vote if they're not going to respect it. I think J.D. Vance, as it was what it was Nicole Wallace who said, Tom, you know, J.D. Vance built this whole house, this whole structure out of toothpicks. And then when he said he wouldn't say that Donald Trump lost the election in 2020, she said the whole thing collapsed. She said, you know, mm-hmm. with that one answer, any anything you might have accrued up until that point was just gone. I, I if I thought she was right. I think I think she's right, too. I mean, I think Vance is trying to do a very delicate walk because he is um, he is performing for an audience of one primarily. But at the same time, I think knowing his ambition, he's got an eye on 2028, maybe 2032, who knows, but he's got an eye on the future. And um, so he wants to present this veneer of um, uh, a happier face on this uh, these, these horrible policies. But he also has to, you know, he has to stay on the good side of his boss. And we know what happens when you get on the bad side of your boss. When your boss is Donald Trump, you end up with a gallows out in front of the the Capitol with your name on it. Oh, they've taken Mike Pence to a secure location. So what? You know? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Exactly. You know, and um, one of the things that was a little bit... That if that I wish had happened more in the vice presidential debate, and Tim Walls did this a couple of times. He was like, "Dude, you're the one who said this guy was Hitler. You know, you're the one who yeah. said he was unfit, and now you're his running mate." I think that Tim said that, but I kind of wished that he had uh, punched it a little more because you know, I mean, there's nothing J.D. Vance. He can't do any kind of tap dance to get around. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, thought this guy was a real loser until, oh, he picked me. I don't know. Well, he had a change of heart, Joan. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he thought that. He, he, he believed what he the media He had a change of no out. heart because he has no heart. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I wanted to ask you too about the uh, the news cycles. I mean, I I, I I remember back when the teapot dome uh, scandal was in the news for months at a time. Now the news cycle is what about six hours long? Um, if that, what? Yeah, I guess you know one thing that I've been really impressed with that that uh, Harris has been able to do that uh, Clinton and. Um, uh, and even Biden didn't seem to be able to do is really manage the news cycles in in a way that is is really impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying that this this recent this recent issue with the, the January sixth, um, uh, you know, the the documents being uh, being uh, made public. I'm not by any means saying that that was a coordination, but boy, they're on top of it and they're using it and they're uh, also seem ready for whatever the next shoe to drop is. Is that your feeling too? What do you make of that? I think the Harris campaign up to this point has been brilliant. I described it within a, within a few days of taking over the top of the ticket. It went from, hey, you know, Joe Biden, rightly so, saying, look at all these great things I did to Harris saying, yeah, but here's where we're going. And she she was edgy. She was sassy. You know, I follow uh, Kamala HQ on social media and I don't know who's posting those things, but man, oh, man, they're good. And they are they are they're not mean, but they're sassy. And they turn around right away when when Donald Trump or J.D. Vance says something really stupid. They they turn they turn it around um, instantly, instantly. Like when J.D. Vance said during the debate, well, you know, I don't know what Democrats are so worried about. There was a peaceful transition of power. And, you know, we gave over power peacefully and they created an ad where they, they had him on repeat. Gave it. It was peaceful. January 20. It was peaceful. It was peaceful. It was peaceful. Like, you know, like, hello. 
Uh, so I, I've heard that she has hired uh, a lot of Obama people and yep. uh, that it was an Obama person who took over the DNC after she was the top of the ticket and completely redid with the schedule at the DNC, who was talking, when they were talking, how they were talking. Um, Obama's people were famous for running great campaigns, and she has now taken on many, if not most, of those folks. And I think uh, I think her campaigning has been brilliant. Yeah, absolutely agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. Um, Tom, we are out of time. I'm. Uh, I we need to catch up sooner. We, let's not wait so long, and uh, and and chat about what's going on. Okay. Would love to do that. Let me just say one more time, if you are tired of hand ringing and want to knock on some doors or pick up the phone and call some people, IndivisibleChicago.com is the place to go. We'll train you up. We'll give you all sorts of support. And it's actually, I'm hearing, too, that the conversations on the phone and at the doors are, are really positive. So oh, hang in there. excellent. Excellent. Tom Moss is with me. We are going to take a break for news, and then it is Thursday. When we come back, we're going to... Talk about the war on women right after this. Hey, where's Hal Sparks? I'm not sure where he is now, but I know where you can find him Saturdays at 11. He'll be right here on WCPT 820 for the Hal Sparks radio program, Mega Worldwide. You're listening to WCPT 820 because facts matter. Joan Esposito, live. Celebrating our power to bring about change. Local. Everybody has to work together. And progressive. I think you get the idea. On WCPT 820. It is Thursday, and every Thursday we do a segment uh, we call the War on Women. We are going to do this four to five hour looking at all the different laws, mostly in state legislatures, that are attacking a woman's right to control her own body, a woman's right to make her own medical decisions. We're going to do this segment every Thursday up until Election Day, and then hopefully after we know that we've elected Kamala Harris to the White House, we can count on the fact that there will be common sense legislation at the federal level. She has said she's willing to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate if it means codifying the protections of Roe v. Wade. So hopefully this will be less of an issue after November 5th. Joining me now to talk about some of these issues is uh, Sonia Suter, who's a professor of law and founding director of the Health Law Initiative at the George Washington University. Sonia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, we talk about you know how we're living now as a post-Roe world. Um, how would you describe the post-Roe world we're living in? Well, I would say it is a world that has led to a huge amount of inequity across our country where some women have much fuller access to reproductive choice and some women are barred almost entirely. I mean, we had some divisions even before Roe was overturned, but now there are outright bans where it's not only harder for women to obtain abortions and other reproductive care, but it is uh, now illegal for them to obtain it. So it is a world in which we're endangering women's lives. Um, and not giving them the freedom to shape the kinds of life they choose for themselves, which has negative impacts on them, their children, and um, everyone, and, and our culture, our, our country as a whole. I know you've written about the fact that the Dobbs decision that struck down Roe v. Wade made things bad, but you also said that there were Supreme Court decisions before that that were impinging on this issue. Talk about those. Yeah, I mean, after Roe was decided, there was a lot of litigation, and for, for, for some time, the court treated this as a fundamental constitutional right, which meant that there was a very high bar. Um, states could um, that tried to regulate abortion could easily be overturned because they would infringe on that right. 
But then in 1992, the Supreme Court decided Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and it made it a little bit easier for abortion regulations to stand as long as they didn't impose an undue burden on the right to an abortion before viability. So states could impose burdens, just not undue burdens. Um, They could impose what was called obstacles, but not substantial obstacles. And that meant that states started to regulate abortions in all sorts of ways, 24-hour waiting periods, requirements for abortion providers and clinics, um, informed consent mandates that sometimes included information that was not accurate. Um, All of these things made it very difficult and more expensive for people to obtain abortions. And uh, that made it, in some cases, almost impossible for women to obtain abortions um, because they lived in areas where there are very few providers and they would have to travel great distances. So we really saw a kind of gradual erosion of the abortion right over time. um, And then Dobbs, of course, completely eliminated the right altogether. Somebody I follow on social media posted very tongue in cheek. It was a guy, too, who said, you know, um, you know, I'm planning, you know, my wife and I have talked about it. I'm planning to get a vasectomy. And you know what? There's no waiting period. I don't have to watch a video. Uh, I don't have to get an ultrasound. My doctor doesn't have to read a bunch of information to me. Um, imagine that. Imagine that, that yes. the government trusts me to yes. make this decision by myself. Just imagine that. There really is misogyny mixed into this pot, isn't there? A hundred percent. That story reminds me of um, uh, a legislative proposal when Virginia was thinking about imposing um, an ultrasound mandate for early abortions. And one of the legislatures, a, f- a woman, uh, proposed including in that in that um, amendment to the bill um, a requirement that men who wanted erectile dysfunction medication should have to um, have a rectal exam um, and also a waiting period. And not, not surprisingly, that didn't pass. So. Yeah, yeah, and and this, I, I think that a, a lot of it too comes from you know we've seen the rise of Christian nationalism and people who don't understand why we have a separation of church and state because you know I don't know if you know this but the founding fathers wanted us to be a Christian nation did you know that Sonia <laughs> that that even, yeah, yeah I know they wrote in a lot of separations and I don't know why they did that because it was clear to everybody they wanted us to be a white Christian state and therefore I think that's why they feel so comfortable trying to legislate their personal religious beliefs so that we all have to follow them. Uh, I, uh, what do you think? No, I, I, th- I think that's right, and I think that they um, see a court that is receptive to these kinds of arguments that sort of puts a religious freedom kind of, um, and, and I guess rights to guns, at sort of the forefront of all of their biggest concerns. And so um, when those religious views come in conflict with other kinds of fundamental, and you could argue human rights, uh, the religious views, and particularly the Christian religious views, prevail. Um, so there's, it's not surprising that we're seeing more efforts to push this because this is a court that that makes clear their view, at least the majority, I should say. Obviously, not all of the justices. Sonia, I know that you're an expert of where law and medicine and ethics come together, especially when it comes to reproductive rights. So were you at all surprised by, um, I don't even remember, I try to blank out which southern state is behaving badly at any given time, (laughs) Uh, but the ruling about IVF and the fact that uh, frozen embryos are actually extra uterine children yeah uh, they're not just a, they're not Alabama. just a conglomeration of cells that has some potential no though no, they're extra uterine children is there a basis in law for that kind of a conclusion there, there is not a basis in law for that conclusion, and some of the justices who wrote concurring opinions, this was the Alabama Supreme Court, um, were very clear that they were turning to um, to the Bible for support in their argument, not to the actual Constitution. Um, now, there was an amendment to the Alabama Constitution that did talk about protecting prenatal life, and so there, there was something in the state legislature that had sort of suggested uh, that prenatal life deserved great protection, and they had never really answered the question about 
about whether an embryo um, created in a petri dish should be treated the same way. But I do think that that position, interestingly, um, is at least consistent with the anti-abortion position. If you believe that life begins the moment an egg is fertilized, then you really kind of have to be anti-IVF because that often involves the destruction of embryos. And I think that shows how far the argument against abortion can go because most Americans do not think that IVF should be banned, including some of the some of the Republican candidates are trying to say IVF is okay, but abortion isn't. Um, and, you know, I think that that just sort of shows that once you sort of go down this path of trying to control health care in the name of protecting what some people view as a person and many people don't, um, you start to interfere with all sorts of medical decisions. But I think that idea that two cells, when they come together as a person, again, that's a religious idea. That's certainly not a scientific idea. And, you know, people, even people who maybe are a little uncomfortable with the idea of abortion, you know, can be big supporters of IVF. You know, they, they are big supporters of contraception. But if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, you have to get rid of IUDs. You have yep. to get rid yep. of uh, medicine contraception. Because if that's your idea, those are abortions as well. Everything can be an abortion if you work hard enough at it. Right. I mean, in fact, I think that some forms of contraception could be at risk under the Dobbs ruling. I mean, medicine disagrees about whether some of these techniques prevent fertilized eggs from getting to the uterus or whether they prevent fertilization in the first place. But if you think there's any chance that a fertilized egg is being um, destroyed through these kinds of contraception, then yes, I agree that that position takes you to say you can't have contraception. And, you know, to your point earlier about the hypocrisy of it, you know, much of this is described in being pro life, right? Caring deeply about life. Um, but the very states that are, that are the most extreme with these laws are the states that do the least to protect the well-being of pregnant women, mm-hmm. the well-being of infants that have the highest levels of maternal and infant mortality. And so there, that then I think really pushes you to ask, is this really about life or the point you made earlier, more really about a kind of misogyny or controlling women to sort of reinforce very traditional kinds of views about what the role of sex is, what the role of women um, is in society. Uh, Because, you know, if you really, really care about life, then you better be doing a whole lot more than preventing abortion and IVF and contraception. Uh, But we don't see that. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, if it were really about life, there'd be free pre-K education. There would be free meals at school because we would want these kids to thrive. But there's none of that. There's, exactly. n- there's, n- there's nothing. It's, uh, it's like, you know, we care about life as long as it's uh, inside a woman. After that, man, you're on your own. Yep. You know? yep. You, you, good luck. Good luck to you. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, well, there, there's, we need to take a break. There's more that I want to talk to uh, okay. Professor Sonia Suter about. Um, we are going to take a real quick break. We'll be back with more after this. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. Professor Sonia Suter is the Henry St. George Tucker III Dean's Research Professor of Law, the Kahan Family Research Professor of Law, and the founding director of the Health Law Initiative. She's a professor at the George Washington University and clearly an expert on reproductive rights. You know, there's a point that I I used to make all the time when I talked about this issue that I haven't talked about for a while, and that is rich, especially white, rich white women have always had access to abortion. That has never been... They're rich white women have never had to go to back alleys to get an abortion. So when we pass these restrictions, we're not, even if there's a ban, it's not really going to affect uh, wealthy women or politically connected women. That abortion option is always going to exist for them. It is the poorer people. It is the people who... um don't have those kinds of connections, who don't have those kinds of doctors that'll nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, over here, we'll, we'll make sure everything gets taken care of. So this is not just an attack on women, 
but it's an attack on the middle and the lower classes of women who actually rely on, you know, laws uh, to to have some of these freedoms. And I think sometimes that gets forget forgotten in all this. Women have always gotten abortions, and the more money you've got, the safer and the quieter the procedure is. And that, that that's not right. That's just wrong. Yeah, I, that, that, that's absolutely true. These inequities have existed um, before Roe, during Roe, um, and and now, of course, it's still true. Um, so we just, what we've done is heightened the inequities, although I will add that um, we are seeing, I mean, I, I suppose the wealthy women who perhaps can't get an abortion are the wealthy women who are in very dire straits, um, and, you know, some of the women who have been litigating the Amanda Zorowski's um, and the Katie Cox case, where they were struggling, I'm not saying they were wealthy women, but they were struggling to get abortions, Um, and even in those states, it's been denied to them sometimes. But it it is interesting to note that the first two cases um, that seem very clearly to be deaths related to abortion bans were both black women. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, I think we've probably had more cases where women have died because of these bans, because it is affecting women of color, it's affecting people with disabilities, it's affecting people who are, who are lower income. So that, that's a terrible inequity, um, that we see from the beginning, right? It's a health inequity generally, but it's really heightened in the reproductive context. There are 10 states that have abortion measures on the ballot. Many of those states uh, have uh, measures that would amend that state's constitution to provide some degree of protection, some degree of autonomy, at least up until quote-unquote viability. Do you see that as a stopgap measure? Do we need something to deal with this on the federal level, or is that what is going to have to happen in each and every state? Yeah, I think I think this is a really important movement, and and it'll be really interesting to see because every other effort um, to try to increase reproductive rights has been successful, right? I think it played a big role in the 2022 elections. Um, Some of these states are states where you already can access abortions, and they're trying to just really solidify the rights. Um, But one of the problems is that in some states you can't have some of these referenda, Um, and so you know there's really no way to overcome the bans that are imposed in those states. And that's why I think you really need something from the federal um, at the federal level, uh, because right now the only way a woman can obtain an abortion is to get medication, abortion pills, or travel. And if you look at the maps of where there are bans, you're talking about huge distances. At the mm-hmm. moment, Georgia allows abortion, um, uh, but that's probably going to be overturned. And so there, there's a big red swath there. If you're in Florida, and if Georgia's um, ban gets reimposed, then, you know, you have to travel a great, great distance before you can get an abortion, which is, again, why people with fewer means struggle to obtain abortions. So we really need something at the national level. It, it, our rights should not depend on where we live within the United States. Yeah, uh, what, a, what a concept. Um, and, you know, Kamala Harris has said that she would be willing to do away with the filibuster to get uh, Roe v. Wade protections codified into federal law. And um, I'm with her a thousand percent on that because I really do think that we need, we need to know where we stand, not just, oh, let's see, um, I just crossed over into Louisiana. Did, did my rights just change, you know? Uh, exactly. The, you know, yeah. and 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 for doctors as, as well. I mean, it, it breaks my heart that these people who take an oath to do no harm to people, to who want to spend their lives helping people, are forced to let people get septic before they take any action for fear that they're going to go to jail. Yes, I mean, this is a huge, huge issue, and I think it's really, it can't be emphasized enough that we are not talking about just a lifestyle choice. We're talking about health care and the provision of health care to largely women. Most people who obtain abortions are women. And um, if you think about what's happening now, the doctors are afraid to perform these procedures, but also afraid to be trained in these states because they cannot learn an important part of obstetric care, which means we will have fewer and fewer people trained to 
practice obstetric and gynecological medicine in many of these states. And so even people who are seeking other kinds of reproductive care that doesn't include abortion are going to have a harder time obtaining that care, have to travel greater distances, will be more difficult to get prenatal care, which will endanger their pregnancies. Going back to my point that these bans actually don't save life, save lives, they actually endanger lives. Um, and, and that's just a horrific thing to think that our health care um, that affects a huge percentage of the population is impeded because of these laws and because the personal views of the legislatures are being imposed on individuals. Yeah, and, and that's, what, that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing nationwide. And, um, you know, I, I remember, oh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Um, there was some measure that was going to be on the ballot there, and it, uh, they got it knocked off. They, I don't know, they challenged, you know, they said some of the people who canvassed and got signatures were mm-hmm. paid to do it, and they didn't disclose, you know, the terms of their agreement. Therefore, all those signatures were invalid. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders gave the snarkiest, snarkiest press, uh, press conference after that. Like somehow the people who wanted uh, abortion rights were too stupid to know how to actually get them on the ballot. I don't understand that. Yeah, well, well there's a lot to. about that. Some of these informed consent measures sort of suggest that women can't make decisions for themselves about whether to end a pregnancy, that they need to be told all sorts of things that they know, right? That it sort of treats the informed consent requirements in many states are very different than what we require for any other medical procedure, suggesting that there's something unique about deciding to have an abortion and that somehow women in that situation are not equipped to make those kinds of decisions. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I think really what's at issue here here in many ways is a question of democracy, right? We don't, we have um, a sort of a view of the few that is being imposed on, on everybody. And, you know, when we look at what the country wants, this is not what they want. This is not the world that the majority of Americans want. Um, it is reflecting the views of, um, you know, Supreme Court justices who were appointed by three of them by a president who didn't win the popular vote, right? It's, it's, and it's really a problematic um, sort of expression of minority view over everybody with lethal consequences. And we see they're, um, they're foreshadowing who they want to be in the future. I don't know if you, if you caught this, the, the J.D. Vance quote about post-menopausal women should give up their careers because they should turn yes. to uh, raising their grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I got to tell you, I mean, because what else, honestly, what else would we live for? I mean, you know, you know, is, do we really want a fulfilling career? What could be more fulfilling than giving everything up to be an unpaid nanny? I, I you know. Yeah, no, I mean, his whole discussion about this sort of demonstrates the point about trying to bring us back to very, very traditional values. I'm, I'm really curious what the discussions are like with his extremely accomplished wife mm-hmm. when he talks this way about what women's hopes and dreams should be and how they've been sort of forced into pursuing these, these rigorous careers um, when apparently they seem to want something else. So, Well, remember really early when she was first being introduced to the public and he made that statement you know she's not white but I really love her anyway and she's a great mom yeah, yeah right there, there. Many I'd be in divorce court right there exactly. right then exactly exactly we'll see how long this marriage lasts yeah really thank you so much uh, Professor Sonia Suter for being here and having this discussion with us for our war on women segment uh, thank you and I'd like to have you back in the near future Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, Sonia is a professor of law, founding director of the Health Law Initiative at the George Washington University. We're going to take a break, and then I'm going to share with you more about what's going on. The good, the bad, and the ugly for the war on women right after this. Take Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive with you on the go by using the TuneIn app on your phone. Just search for WCPT 820. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT Willow Springs is powered by ComEd. Visit comed.com slash clean. 
Now back to Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. It is our regular Thursday segment. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., we talk about the war on women. We're going to do this segment up till the election. And then after Kamala Harris gets elected, we're going to sit back and take a breath and wait for things to get better. But things are um, still going to be disappointing on some days this week. Louisiana took the two drugs that are used for a medication abortion, which is over half of all abortions. Uh, You just take some pills. They bring on a period. End of story. Mifepristone and misoprostol. Uh, those two drugs, the state of Louisiana is reclassifying those. They are now classified as controlled substances, you know, like uh, opium and heroin and uh, morphine. Yeah, they have reclassified mis- mifepristone and misoprostol in the state of Louisiana as controlled substances. So if you have those drugs and you cannot show a legitimate prescription for those drugs, you could be sent to prison for five years. What's that, a kilo of cocaine? Oh, no, it's um, mifepristone. Show me, show me that prescription or you're going to jail. This is the first state, you know, sometimes these crazy red states, they'll pass something that seems really outrageous, but then the rest of the red states go, oh, they got away with it. Maybe we should try that too. This so far is the first law like this in the nation. It uh, reclassifies Bifepristone and Misoprostol as Schedule Four Controlled Substances. Yeah which is what you generally do if uh, if you feel the drugs have a potential potential to addict someone so abortion is already pretty much banned in Louisiana so that means um mifepristone and misoprostol couldn't even be prescribed for an abortion in the state of Louisiana But you know those drugs, they have other uses. And if you have a condition that you used to treat with those, remember when these, um, when legislators started going after these drugs, people who suffered from lupus were finding that they couldn't get their prescriptions filled because the argument was some of those drugs used to treat lupus can be used to bring on an abortion. So people with lupus can't use them anymore. This has nothing to do with these drugs' safety. You're not going to get addicted to abortion medication. That ain't how it works. It's just another way to try to enshrine into law an anti-woman, anti-health, anti-medicine, Anti health care, anti autonomy, religious rule into law. In Louisiana, if you have misoprostol and you take it because of some health condition, if you're planning to go to Louisiana, you better make sure that you have the prescription. Because it is a class four scheduled controlled substance in the state of Louisiana as of this week. Took effect this week. Yay. The war on women continues. And, um, Man, I want to bury these people at the polls. I really do. I want the 10 states that have abortion measures 
on their November ballot, I want those measures to pass by a landslide. I want people to be so upset about this that they just go all down ballot with Democrats. I want to see the U.S. Senate. I don't care if it's a slim margin. I want to see the U.S. Senate in Democratic hands. Because in case you have missed this news item, the Republicans are already saying, you remember how Mitch McConnell wouldn't let President Obama make a nomination to the Supreme Court, even though there was a vacancy and there was he was only three years into his four year term. And Mitch McConnell was like, oh, it's too close to the election. The Republicans have already said that if they control the Senate, there will be no Supreme Court seats filled by a Democratic president. And it's also believed that if for some reason Donald Trump, through some freak of nature, pulls this election off, chances are um, at least Clarence Thomas will resign. Alito might as well. Um, They might resign, and that means Donald Trump would have at least one, if not two, appointments to the Supreme Court. He's going to do what he did before. He's going to find, uh, the Heritage Foundation is going to find for him somebody in their 40s who's a radical, radical far-right Republican. And then he will have um, named five justices. And we will be locked in to partisan decisions from a corrupt court for not only our lifetime, our kids' lifetime, and frankly, a good portion of our grandkids' lifetime. Right after the vice presidential debate, J.B. Pritzker sat down with Alex Wagner on uh, MSNBC. They talked about a lot of things, but J.B. Pritzker talked with Alex Wagner post-debate about abortion. I want to share that with you right now. Listen to J.B. Pritzker on abortion. I was struck by his, I mean, just how candid he was in terms of the problem Republicans understand themselves to have on the issue of abortion. He at one point said, we have got to do a much better job on abortion, and also said, not all Americans agree with what I've said before, which is a litany of strange and weird proclamations on everything to what postmenopausal women should be doing to the age at which women should be having children. Um, Do you, I mean, first of all, that seems to reflect, uh, you know, broad thinking inside the GOP that they are hemorrhaging voters on this you know, on this topic. What did you think of his concession to how badly the party's doing on the topic? Well, I remember what he was really saying. He was basically saying, well, trust me and trust Donald Trump, right? That, that you know, we'll, we'll do the right thing. Trust us. And you heard Tim Walz say, we trust women. That's what Democrats stand for. That's what Kamala Harris and Tim Walz stand for. So I thought that contrast was very, very clear. And yeah, the Republican Party Party has a lot to answer for because the deaths that Tim Walls is talking about of women who aren't able to get the kind of reproductive services that they deserve because doctors feel like they might go to prison if they perform those services um, because it's been criminalized in so many states. I mean, I'm in Illinois where we've had to create an oasis for people because every state around us has criminalized or gotten rid of abortion services. So people are traveling hundreds of miles, unfortunately. But at least they have a place to go to protect themselves. Tim Walls believes that the entire country should be the haven for women. You should be able to go to your local hospital, your local doctor, and get the reproductive services you deserve. Whereas Donald Trump and and J.D. Vance are okay with people dying in the parking lot. Well, right. And J.D. Vance at one point expresses effectively condolences for Amber Thurman, the woman in Georgia, who died because she had to leave that abortion desert, go get care in North Carolina, and die and effectively the back and forth of treatment. But then also, on the same hand, J.D. Vance says, but I think the abortion decision is best left to the states. Well, this is like everything with the Republicans, right? Their policies lead to people's deaths, and then they say, oh, thoughts and prayers. Yeah, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Are you getting tired of thoughts and prayers? Because i got to tell you, I'm awfully tired of thoughts and prayers. 
We are going to take a break. We are going to be back with more after this. Chicago's Progressive Talk, WCPT 820, where facts matter. Oh, I'm sorry, Lady B. It's time for uh, Hochberg, <laughs> taking one of my famous little naps that I am <laughs> that I am known to do. So, uh, do you want to buy a new house? Do you want to refinance the one you've got? You may have seen the Jerome Powell lowering interest rates half a percentage point. Yeah, you know what that means? That means that most rates on credit cards, car loans, home equity loans, and oh, by the way, mortgages are also lower. Mm-hmm. David Hochberg says mortgage rates are at their lowest levels since last February, right now. And that Team Hochberg is ready to help you either refinance or get ready to refinance. So if your interest rate on your mortgage is above 6.5%, mm, call Team Hochberg. Call them now. And they will look everything over. They'll look your mortgage over. They will tell you what kind of rates they can get you, what the closing costs will be. And they will do that all for free. Okay? Team Hochberg, 855-563-2843 or go online, 56david.com. That number again, 855-563-2843 or go online, 56david.com. Lower.com equal housing lender, NMLS 1124061. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. Um, one other thing, one other sound clip that I want to uh, share with you on this topic. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Sarah Longwell. She's part of the Bulwark. You know, that was the group that uh, Bill Crystal and Charlie Sykes and Jonathan Last started. They were never Trumpers. They were Republicans, conservatives, but never Trumpers. And uh, they started a group called the Bulwark. Charlie uh, Sykes has since gone off on his own. You see him on MSNBC all the time. But there's still a group of them, Tim Miller, Sarah Longwell, and they do podcasts and they report and they post on social media. And one of the other things that they do is they do focus groups sometimes where they'll get voters together and ask them, how uh, they feel about things. And um, Sarah Longwell recently was on cable TV, and she was talking about women and uh, some of the things that they believe that are happening with women politically, some of the focus groups where uh, women are sharing their thoughts. And a lot of it has to do with the Republican Party. A lot of it has to do with abortion. Uh, there is um, a, rec- a crazy Republican running for Senate in Ohio, Bertie Moreno, who has just said some J.D. Vance like stupid things about women and abortion and um, has gotten himself into a lot of hot water. But anyway, Sarah Longwell addressed this whole issue, Bernie Moreno, Republicans, or how women feel about abortion, but mostly just about how women feel about this election. Listen to this. What is interesting about the Moreno comments is this idea that that the reason that women are breaking disproportionately for Kamala Harris is just because of abortion. That is wrong. Um, women care very much about the economy. They care about crime. They care about immigration. They care about all the same issues that uh, that men do. I think what's happening, though, is that the Republican Party and Donald Trump specifically has a strategy of trying to run up the numbers with men. That is why he picked J.D. Vance as his running mate. And in doing so, though, they don't just try to appeal to men. They are running a campaign that is actively alienating to women. It is not just about policy issues. It is about the way that J.D. Vance attacks childless cat ladies, which, by the way, in all of my focus groups, that has broken through. But that's not even as pernicious as the things that he 
says, like, uh, if women are with somebody who is abusive, they should stay with that man, right? We hear things like that from the vice presidential candidate. As you point out, Trump is an adjudicated uh, rapist and uh, has always been misogynistic. You've got candidates like Mark Robinson down in North Carolina, uh, who says that he is avowedly pro-life, committed pro-life, except for the abortion that uh, he paid for for he and his wife uh, back in the day, not to mention all of the other issues that he has, uh, calling himself a black Nazi, pornography. I mean, just this, Dana White from the UFC, who had just been caught on camera hitting his wife, was featured, introduced Donald Trump at the Republican National Convention. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of the way that this Republican Party uh, creates a sense that women don't have a place in that coalition. Uh, and so for Donald Trump to treat them like the the I am your protector is a particular form of gaslighting. It's almost like somebody uh, who is an abuser, the way that they would then talk to the abused to try to keep them sort of encircled or ensnared by them. But based on the poll numbers and his dismal poll numbers with women, women are not falling for it. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. I believe there is a silent majority out there. It is comprised in part of women who, whether or not there are husbands and significant others are Trumpers, women who are appalled by Donald Trump and will secretly be voting against him. And not just women. I think that there are prominent Republicans not the people who are ignorant of what's going on and not the people who are homophobic and racist, but I believe there are intelligent, prominent Republicans who may not be willing to come out publicly and vote for Kamala Harris. They may not be interested in telling their friends and neighbors that they no longer support Donald Trump. But I think even people who have supported him previously are sick of him sick of his nonsense, sick of his being such a horrible person to everybody, everywhere, all at once. They're not going to tell pollsters. They're not going to tell their family members. They're not going to tell their neighbors. They're not going to have a yard sign out. But I think there is a silent majority of people who have previously voted Republican, they've previously voted for Trump, who are going to get inside that polling place and vote against him this time around. One last, um, I guess we're coming full circle. I started the day today um, kind of making fun of Melania because uh, CNN released paperwork that they got from her publisher you know, she's just put this memoir out, and uh, the publisher sent CNN a letter saying, oh, that's great, you want to you want to interview Melania, that's wonderful. We would love for you to interview Melania. Uh, just pay her $250,000 and sign all of these uh, non-disclosure forms, and we will get that set up. <laughs> yeah, and CNN was kind of, what? Well, it's um, getting a lot of attention today. Some video she posted where she is uh, supposedly saying that one right that can never be compromised is a woman to have rights over her own body and what she does with that body. And, you know, that's something that just can't be compromised. First of all, I think that somebody told her that if she made a statement like that, she and her book would get a lot of attention, and that happened. I wouldn't be mentioning it otherwise. Some people who are perhaps more cynical than you and me are speculating that she's doing it to help Donald Trump, that she's deliberately trying to muddy the waters, because he knows abortion is a real losing issue for him. And he has been backing away from it. And he's been trying to say that nobody's going to take care of women like I'm going to take care of women. Nobody's going to take care of women like I'll take care of women when I'm in the presidency. And, oh, in vitro fertilization should be free. That is unless we ban it. He uh, He's doing the Donald Trump thing where he is trying to find out what people want and then pretend that's what he's going to do. 
When somebody shows you who you are, who they are, believe them, you know, and he has shown us who he is. So is she trying to subtly help her husband by further complicating things? I personally would like to believe that she's doing it as a kind of a screw you to her husband, but I don't think she's made that way. I think uh, like her husband, she's out for herself. What's best for Melania? How can I make the most money in the shortest amount of time? I don't believe that she is a huge supporter of a woman's right to bodily autonomy. And frankly, even if it were true, I don't think he would care. I don't think he cares what Melania thinks about anything. Do you? Not when he's got Laura Loomer by his side. The woman who is so far right, she almost makes Donald Trump look middle of the road. She is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And she is with him on that plane mm, 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 all the time. Ah. <sighs> The Trump family, man, oh, man. Let's get rid of these grifting clowns, shall we? Please. Please, if for no other reason than we are getting rid of the grifters, get out there and help Kamala Harris get elected. Please, I beg of you, whatever you can do, take whatever skill set you've got and bring it to this election, to these campaigns. You're an artist, draw some posters. And put some posters out in your neighborhood. Whatever skill you've got, Whatever you can bring to this campaign, you got to do it. We got to row flat out from the beginning of the race till we cross the finish line. Uh, I want to let you know that um, Patty has a big guest tonight. She is going to be talking to Michigan Congresswoman Hillary Scholten. And guess what they're going to talk about? Reproductive freedom. How, how appropriate for Thursday. She, in her own way, is going to continue to shine a light on the war on women. She's also going to be joined by Dan Feehan and Amber Milos of Flip the States. And uh, Matt McNeil, host of the Matt McNeil Show, which is here weeknights, 9 to 10, on WCPT. Add in Dan Schaefer of the Recom- Recombobulation Area, and it is going to be a jam-packed show that Patty Vasquez is going to be starting uh, right after we do news at the top of the hour. And um, remember, our day starts tomorrow at 6 a.m. Well, technically it starts at 5 a.m., you know, with um, a replay of Rick Smith. By the way, I wanted to update you. Carol is his wife who was in a motorcycle accident. She is having another surgery to repair the bones in her hand. He is looking for a long-term rehab facility for her right now because, as he said in one of his most recent posts, um, the bones are easy to fix, but the injuries to her brain, that's going to take a real commitment, a long time, and a lot of work. But he is thankful that he still has her around. So that's where things stand with Rick Smith's wife, Carol, as of this moment in time. As I started to say, Richard Chu will be here tomorrow at 6 a.m. He's going to be joined by Karen Byrne of the True Blue Politics podcast. And uh, Michelle Duster is also going to join him. She is um, known for her work to preserve the legacy of her great-grandmother, Ida B. Wells. Uh, We had her on a long, long time ago, and she has been working nonstop since then. That's Choose Views tomorrow, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. I will, of course, join you tomorrow at 2 p.m. We are going to spend the first half of the show taking calls and talking to you about the news of the day. And then we're going to be joined uh, toward the end of the show uh, by Chris Beery. We haven't spoken to Chris Beery since the vice presidential debate. So we'll have to have a chat with him about that. I will see you tomorrow. Until then, stay safe, my friends. Have a great evening and good night.